morning, everyone. Actually, I shouldn't say good morning. I think we just kicked it over to the afternoon on the East Coast. So wherever you are, hello. Uh, welcome to Invest in Yourself today. And feel free to say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from if you want. Yeah, it's still morning on the East Coast. Good morning, everybody. Still morning. I got ahead of myself. We're very early for those of you on the West Coast, so thank you for getting up. True. It's true. And I will uh, try to have enough energy to uh, keep you going. I hope you've got some... Uh, got something to drink. Caffeinated beverage of choice or non-caffeinated or whatever. Everybody adjusting to the time change. Anybody doing anything exciting with their extra hour of daylight? Always find there's very mixed opinions on who's for this extra hour and who who doesn't enjoy daylight saving time. So I feel like we got probably very mixed opinions here. Give everybody a minute or two more to log in, get yourself settled, and we'll go ahead and kick it off. Oh, we got the whole spread here from the east to the west. Yeah, oh, I'm with you. I'm with you, Natalie. The dogs definitely don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, our cats do not uh, agree with this concept of. Uh, I feel like it's easier to go the other way. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, exactly. It's, just, it's tough. Oh, we got um, right. somebody from Argentina, too. There we go. All right, so I'm trying to rearrange my screen here so that I can see both my notes and the chat. So, for those of you just joining us for day two, we have a schedule change. I want to let you know, unfortunately, that our 12 o'clock session, um, Bella is ill. So unfortunately, she won't be able to join us at noon. So feel free to come find a table to hang out at but or take an extra long lunch, whatever. <laughs> whatever you want to do today, unfortunately, we won't have that 12 o'clock session. But Christy Tucker is here to kick us off for Invest in Yourself. Um, Christy Tucker is actually a seasoned learning designer. Um, she has is specialized in or specializing in scenario based learning to enhance skill transfer in, into real world applications. So she's got 20 years of experience in the field, served a lot of a lot of companies, including Fortune 500 companies, um, government agencies, and is a blogger and a speaker in instructional design and the e learning industry. And we're so lucky to have her today talking about. Uh, a topic that needs to be talked about more, um, investing in yourself. So I think a lot of us get caught up in our jobs from day to day and we kind of forget to help ourselves and make sure that we are learning and upskilling and doing the th things that we need to do to be our best selves. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Christy. I'm going to mute myself and, and disappear for a while. Um, if you have questions, please, per please pop them in the chat or not the chat, the Q&A. Um, and we'll make sure that we get those answered for you. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending this morning. Um, it is nice to see some uh, familiar names and faces in the chat, as well as uh, some new names. So I think that this Invest in Yourself, is, as Abby said, this is one of these things that, one of these topics that I, I thought fit for this event, because we do have this tendency as women too often prioritize everybody else before ourselves. We don't necessarily take that time to prioritize in our own skill development. So the goal for what we're going to talk about today is the strategies and some resources for continuously developing your own skills. And that's, that's the big goal here. So three sections to this, a little bit very briefly about why you need to invest in yourself and make that a priority. Some of the strategies of how to make the time and make it a priority. And then we're gonna talk about some specifics about what to learn and I want to do a bit of crowdsourcing from you all of what resources you're using as well. So think about it a little bit if there's some favorite resources you wanna share. Um, but this is a topic I've, I've spoken about a couple of times I've done for my, uh, my local ATD chapter a while back about, you know, how do you keep up with the trends in the field and, and done things? And because I think it is a challenge for 
for most of us, right? Because there's always so much out there. And and I'm guilty of this too, right? There is that cultural prefer- pressure to help everybody else. We are, and, and I think inherently in the L&D field, we're people who like helping other people. Inherently, that is part of who we are. That's why we're in this field, right? But you also have to invest in yourself. And so this is also something I know some of you are freelancers um, and consultants. And some of the things I'm going to talk about here are also, I'm going to talk about some of this in terms of if you're an employee and some of this, if you're a freelancer or a consultant. If you're a freelancer, it's it's very easy to spend all of your time working in your business without spending any time working on your business. And so some of this is also thinking about the ways that you work on your business as a freelancer or a consultant. If you're an employee, you still need to work on your own development and you still need to do those business development skills, but it is going to look a little bit different when you are a full-time employee. And sometimes it is that you need, even if as an employee, that you need to take charge of it rather than relying on your employer to direct you to your own development. So we're going to take both of those kind of tacks of, yes, the professional development, but also some of this working, working on your business, um, if you're looking at it from that, from that freelancer and consultant perspective. Um, because since I've been working on my own now for over 10 years, that's, that's also the perspective that I'm coming from. I was a full-time employee for a number of years before that. So thinking about this, you know, approaching this as, as instructional designers and LD folks, let's start by defining the problem. What are the obstacles that keep you from investing in yourself and your own skill development and your own professional development right now? Let's put some things in the chat about what gets in the way? Time, the first three, the first five, uh, the first, I don't know, 10 answers, time. Yep, sometimes finances, yep. Other people's needs, also an important one, Natalie. Cannot disagree with that. Yep. So Bridget's coming at this from that perspective of a business owner, that that need to constantly develop leads and have work on your pipeline for as a business owner, rather than taking some of the slow time to also work in your professional development. Lack of strategies to prioritize. Organizational priorities may not be aligned with your individual goals. That's a hard one too, Hillary. I think that that's, that's, um, that's a thing to, to juggle. And the, the, I don't know what I'm doing. I have to learn something else first. Uh, Lenore, the, the perfectionist and all or nothing. Oh, if I can't be world-class at this, I probably shouldn't even bother trying. That's, that's a really good one too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is, these are, these are real challenges. So some of this is, so time is a big one. And we're going to talk I, in the strategies. We're going to talk about strategies for time and how to do some of that. Um, for money, I, I cannot magically wave my wand and give you all money for professional development, sadly. But we can talk about how to get more bang for your buck. And I think some of these other, these other issues of, organizational things and, and not knowing and that perfectionist all or nothing that I, I've got a slide later, Lenore, that I think it helps with that perfectionist all or nothing, the that feeling that you have to be, you have to be able to do everything. This is a field, one of our challenges in learning and development is we're such a multidisciplinary field with so many variations, and it is simply not possible to learn everything, right? So there's so much out there. And that 
also can be a bit of an obstacle. So what's the risk? So why does it matter if you invest in yourself, especially if you're already great at what you do, if you're comfortable where you are? The first risk is change. The world is always changing. Right now, the big change is AI and nobody really knows what it's going to look like long term. It is not clear how that's going to affect the field of learning and development in the future. So continuous learning helps you be ready for whatever comes next. Second is that there is more competition in the field now than there was 10 years ago. There, there are, if you, even if you are an employee and you have no intention of looking for a job, the harsh reality of this is that I have seen more good people get laid off in the last year um, than is really a comfortable number, right? The, and the job market does seem to be harder now than when I joined the field 20 years ago. It, no matter how good you are, and, and I had a hard time getting a job for that first instruction design job. My spreadsheet of how many things I had applied for and followed up and did interviews, every that had 20, 200 rows in it because it took me so long to get that first job. People who are trying to do it now are have even a harder time. And so, well, I think we, we, we all mostly think of each other as colleagues and maybe not competition. And that is true. I think that there's a lot of that support. We're all here volunteering time to help each other. I think for people who are job searching and looking for clients, there is some reality to the fact that the job competition is harsh, even if you are really good. Um, because yeah, there's, there is this experience and, and yeah, I'm, I fully expected we would have multiple people in here who have experienced some of this and it sucks. Um, so, and getting more skills, isn't the only thing that's going to fix finding a job because the job market is also broken in other ways, but it is at least one of the things you have some control over. The good news is you're already here. Congratulations, give yourself a pat on the back. You have already decided to invest in yourself by coming to this conference, right? So we have this. There is also the advantage that if you're here and you're in L&D in general, people in learning and development really do tend to be naturally curious they tend to value learning, even if we don't always find ways to make it happen. And, and in practice, we don't always do it, but that value is there. We also do have a community of support. TLDC has been this great community. And overall, in the L&D field, there are so many generous people who genuinely want to be helpful. And so um, there are people out there who are interested in helping, including everybody who is speaking and hosting and volunteering to organize this event, right? Like everybody's here because we're trying to help. So that's all the good news. So in the why of this, there is already stuff in your favor. So the strategies, that was the why. So then we're gonna get into the how a little bit on how to prioritize learning because everybody is pressured for time. We are supposed to be juggling all the things. It is the stereotypical, we're, we're trying to be super women and do it all. It affects us. So, you maybe have heard of the profit first model for finances. If you're a, a business owner, the idea is that you pay yourself first and your business, and then you do your other expenses out of that. 
similarly, I think with investing in your own skills, you have to pay yourself first. You have to put on your own oxygen mask before you help others with theirs. And again, for freelancers, it's really easy to get caught up in client work and not work on your business or to totally just work on filling that pipeline like Bridget had mentioned, right? Getting the leads and doing that marketing thing, but not actually do the work to make yourself better to continuously improve. And then you aren't really, you're not, you're not working on those skills. When you're an employee, you can be pulled in so many directions that it's really hard to take that time, right? Somebody's paying you to do work. How dare you take an hour off to do a little reading or watch a webinar or do some professional development? How dare you take an hour to go try out a tool and see how it works and figure out if whether it would actually work for your a project or not. I have had some employers and some managers who supported that, who were like, yep, like part of the job is doing the reading and doing that experimentation, but for sure not everything. So the reality is there will always be projects and meetings other than those of you who I see are, are, are unemployed. And so even when you're busy, you need to make yourself a priority. And so you have to figure out how to spend some time every week working on your own skills or building your business, right? That working on your business. Does anybody remember the Franklin Covey planners? Is, have some of you been out in the workforce long enough to remember the Franklin Covey thing? Um, right. Okay, good. All right. Good, good, good. All right. So I'm so glad that I am not the oldest person here. And some of you remember this, right? Big rocks, little rocks. Yes. Um, okay, good. So that was all the rage in the organization where I had my first instruction design job there. And the idea from Franklin Covey was the sharpening the saw that you would take the time. If you're cutting down a tree, you need to take some time to sharpen the saw so that you can cut down the tree faster. And I know it's so cliche because that's been around for a while. Part of why it got to be cliche is because it is still true though. So spending some of this time to sharpen the saw, to improve your skills can make you more efficient and can make all of these things that we all have to juggle, you can be better at it. And so, yes, Laura not only remembers when indoor malls were definitely a thing where we all hung out more, uh, but they had in-person stores. I think I still have some of those binders around. I just have my to-do list with my 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, right? You'd have your prioritized to-do list. Um, so that I think is part of it. So one of the easiest ways to pay yourself first is to literally schedule some time on your calendar. Make a recurring appointment for doing some sort of professional development, whatever that is going to be. You can reschedule this appointment, but try not to cancel it. Now, the reality, you know, in, in the goal, of course, is that you put this on your calendar and then if some meeting comes up, you move it to a different spot, right? You reschedule it. In reality, if you are sick or it's a short week because it's a holiday or whatever, the professional development is the thing that's going to get caught, right? Like it, it just is. But by booking this time, you give yourself that cushion and you also do it also putting it on your calendar helps me when i am planning out project plans to build a little bit of time into projects so that i do have enough slack that i don't have to be working like a sprint the whole project that i can plan my projects with enough breathing room that i can in fact spend one hour reading a book listening to a webinar doing a thing. I love that idea to, to do curious time. Um, 
if you are a freelancer or consultant doing some version of the self-employed route, a minimum of 20% of your time is need should be working on your business. Which means that's really, you know, you need to be probably scheduling either um, you can set it aside as one day a week or realistically you have some time every day. Most people who I've talked to who are freelancing, consultant, self-employed are spending at least 20% of their time working on the business. Um, that's the being on LinkedIn. That's your blogging, your content marketing, some of those things. Figure out how to split up that time so that some of it's the getting leads and marketing things. And some of that is also the working on your skills thing. If you are just getting started doing self-employed, it is not uncommon for that to be 50%. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind if you are going down that self-employed route that you the goal is never to try to get yourself to 40 hours a week of billable time. That's not really sustainable if you're trying to run a business because you have to have time to work on your business, to have the pipeline, to have the next things. So some of this is also focusing on what you want. So thinking about your goals of what is it that you want to do and how are you going to work step by step to get there? So, you know, if part of one of your goals maybe is to just generally to improve your skills in, in AI tools, and maybe this does not need to be a, you know, fully me measurable objective in ABCD format, right? Like I'm not necessarily saying you do that or a full smart goal for yourself. Um, but something of, okay, if you want to do, if you want to, be comfortable working in AI tools and keep up with what's happening in the field, that then it is that you're going to have to spend some time every week or every day trying out these tools and using them for things. Um, at one of the conferences I attended last year, people were trying, you know, AI is definitely, you know, was the, was the big topic of, of a lot of different things. And there were multiple people who talked about that they've literally booked time on their calendar to test out AI tools because it is changing so fast right now that you need that time. I've also read that it takes about 10 hours of work to get good at using any of the large language models. The large language models are the things like ChatGPT and Claude and Gemini, which used to be Bard, those sort of chatbot ones. It takes, it takes a few hours of using a tool to sort of get a sense for what is this good at? How do I do the prompting? Where's the edges of what does it not do well and how do I reprompt to get it back on track? 10 hours is doable if you're spending an hour or two a week. But you have to you have to keep practicing with it. All of these things are better with practice. And it does you you can you are all capable of learning how to use these tools i have faith in you but you do need to make some time for them another way to approach some of this with professional development and and the business things too is to keep a list of sunday projects so this is the things you will read someday or the samples you're going to build on your portfolio. When you have unexpected downtime, check something off that list. It is so much easier. Okay, so all of a sudden your, your SME is out sick and the review is going to be delayed by two days. So what are you doing for those two days? I keep this all on Trello. This is, this is my list. Stuff I want to do on my website, stuff I want to add to my portfolio, stuff I want to do on my blog. I have some other professional develop specific professional development things. It is so much easier when you suddenly get an hour. It's much easier to start from an existing list rather than staring at a blank screen and feeling overwhelmed by the hundred different things that you could do. So 
for me, so anytime you're working on a project and you come up, you think of that like, gee, you know, I really wish I had time to spend a little bit more effort digging into this. So like, oh, I wanted to go back and, and read this thing. So like your, or your stretch project, or, you know, I want to fiddle around with this tool and try out and see if this one will work for me. Portfolio samples to give yourself a little stretch project. Your to read list, some research, right? You're, you know your portfolio should be a living document that you always update. And most of us are not investing in ourselves enough to do it. If you looked at my portfolio recently, you can see my website is very dated and I really need to like do that update. Um, that's why there's a long list there. Um, the samples are okay. I've updated some samples, but the website itself is, needs a big refresh. Um, so every time one of those projects goes up, take two minutes, put it on your list, whether you're keeping this in Trello or Evernote or whatever you are doing, make a list. You do need to actually document this. Then when you're waiting for SMEs, when you are, when you need, or it's the, the, oh my God, I've been working in Storyline for six hours straight and I've got to look at something else for 30 minutes. You have one of these things to give yourself that cognitive break. And you have your list ready to go. And I think, Bridget, this is, this is also a really good point, right? When you're tempted to scroll mindless things online, you open your Trello board and read something that you've pinned to read later rather than say going to the instruction design reddit and getting into arguments not that anybody i know is guilty of that but um yeah so yeah project scoping um so all of these things i mean i also have a do read list i i've been using a tool called digo for a long time for keeping website bookmarks i i don't actually think that's the right tool anymore. It's not really updated as much, but I, I, that's where I do my bookmarks and I flag some things as that to read later too. Um, so this is one of these strategies to use your limited time more effectively. One of the things on my professional development on those lists is I have like five different alternatives to Digo that I want to try out and see which one I'm going to use as my replacement. And so, yeah, I think that Scribble is on on my list and Pinboard and Raindrop and a couple other things, right? Like I need to I need to do that like testing out another tool. It hasn't happened, but but probably will this year. So conferences and webinars. Having something on a specific date can also motivate you to prioritize investing in yourself in ways that just working on your own might not. There are tons of free webinars and events out there since I know money was also one of the other things. Um, so take advantage of them, right? TLDC obviously is um, has lots of these free events like this one. We, we also have the advantage of having things that are, you know, TLDC is $75 a year, so it's not terribly expensive. It is more affordable. There are definitely some more affordable options. So yes, that's my plug to like go pay for TLDC. Um, Learning Guild and ATD both have a fair amount of free resources available, but those also may be worth, I've paid for the Learning Guild online conferences subscription um, for a number of years, ATD, your local chapter might be a great resource and not necessarily terribly expensive for local chapters if your local chapter is active. Training Mag Network does literally hundreds of free webinars a year. Um, you know, know that you need to set up your email filters to accommodate the fact that they're going to email you like 15 times a week. So like set it up accordingly so that you can tolerate it. But like there is good stuff out there. The learning development accelerator is a newer group, but they're definitely, if you're looking at the learning science, um, they're a really good group. Clark Quinn's been doing is one of the people running that. Uh, Julie Dirksen's doing some stuff with LDA right now too. So that's a, a another great place to look. Um, conferences, 
are really good. The in-person conferences can be really good for professional development, um, as well as for networking and for building your brand, your business. In-person conferences are expensive, and I know that they are not a reachable for everybody, um, which is why I'm mostly talking about some of these other things. However, Learning Guild, ATD, and Training Mag all give you free admission, free registration to the conference if you present. Sometimes there's opportunities for volunteering as well, so you can save some money. Um, so if you can do those things and then, you know, only be paying for travel, that can potentially bring it into a more reachable um, level. Um, still, I realize like not everything. And if you look at my schedule, you'll you'll see I'm doing two in-person conferences a year. I am not one of the people who's going to go do eight in-person conferences a year because yes, they're all business expenses. Yes, it's also my money that I have to spend to do it. And I don't get enough out of those conferences. So a little of that is, is potentially good though. And so look at it and look for the ways to maybe save some money too. So a little bit of a story here. Earlier, uh, early on near the beginning of the pandemic, my daughter decided that she really wanted to learn how to crochet little amigurumi, these little kind of critters. And so I'm like, oh, there are a zillion crochet videos for free on YouTube and all of these free patterns. I'm a very smart person. I can totally figure this out on my own with just YouTube stuff. I'll be able to figure it out. So I kind of did a little bit and then I was trying to make a rectangle. I'm like, I'm just gonna make a little rectangle and figure this out. And my rectangle ended up as a little trapezoid as it kept getting shorter every row. And I could not figure it out. Uh, I tried and like tried different channels. Okay, so the reality is I needed more structure. I needed more support. So I paid for a crochet kit. And yeah, I didn't have any stitch markers either, which was the other problem, which is for sure one of the things that was going wrong. So so I went, I'm like, oh, I keep getting these ads for the woobles. Like, let me try this thing. So I did a little penguin and sure enough, it was a ton easier. Um, they come with a pre-started thing. So if you've never done this, um, it is so much easier to start with something that is already started for you rather than just a loose piece of yarn. Like having that pre-start, having it come with color-coded stitch markers. They put stitch markers in the first three stitches so that you could do it and just get started. Then they have videos. They specifically also have videos that help you explain how to figure out what went wrong if you made a mistake. So if you count your stitches and you realize, oh, I'm supposed to have 18 and I had 17, like they tell you how to do that. It is the kit with the materials and those videos. And it's, it really was doable. I really could not do it from just YouTube videos. So yes, there's lots of free resources out there. And sometimes you need the structure of a formal course. Sometimes it is worth sucking it up and paying for the actual resources. And then, you know, you can have your little, your little prayers. Um, so if I had not paid, I, I got stuck with the free stuff, right? Um, and so, yeah. And, and clearly, like, there, there are other things that could have happened. And had this been a point in the pandemic when I could have gone to things in person, like going in person to the yarn store and getting help in person, probably would have been doable. Since that was in the stage where there were no vaccinations and everybody was shut down, this was the thing that, that got me through. And clearly, there are people who can figure it out from YouTube videos. And if you're one of those, great. Like, this is not, you know, like Natalie's in here, who I know has been doing this and is much more skilled than I am because I've got stuff. I have a pair of, I, I have, I think, fingerless gloves that Natalie made me a, a long time ago. Right? We've got some of this. Um, 
this is true for all sorts of skills, right? And this is, of course, part of why we're here, right? We make formal training because it is not always easy to just cobble things together, even from well-curated resources. Um, over 10 years ago, Wendy Wickham left a comment on my blog about how more skills equals more opportunities. And um, instructional design tends to be a field for generalists. Um, Kathy Moore, for example, no experience in developing in any of the authoring tools, although she did learn Twine um, for writing and, and building branching scenarios, so she could do that. Um, and so, you know, if you're as good of a writer as Kathy Moore, you can do fine without learning anything technical. For most of the rest of us who are not as good at writing as Kathy Moore is, we have to do a little bit of everything. Um, so I think that I, I'm going to switch here to do a little bit of talking about what we're going to learn. Um, I did want to pause and do look at the, um, the Q and a, a little bit, um, Abby, um, Let's see, there's a, a couple of, okay, so I see suggestions here. Do you wanna, can we go through the questions, Abby? Well, I think this is a good place yeah, to pause. Absolutely, absolutely. Let, me, yeah. let me pull them up here. Should we should just start at the top. I've got one, Molly's is at the top. So I'll just pop that one on stage and we can take a look here. Um, hoping to get ideas about flexible scheduling specific for neurotypes who are bored easily uh, by constant repetition. How do you hold space uh, for curious time and focused work while allowing for spontaneous inspiration activities? I think that's a great question. I, I do think, so I, I will say I have, I also have a low tolerance for boredom. It is part of why I like this field so much um, because there is always something more to learn and there, there will never be a point where I know everything. 20 years in, I do not feel like there is less to learn. <laughs> it's different things to learn, especially branching out from other fields. Um, so I do think that that, um, for me, it is uh, part of, again, part of why I like being self-employed and being a consultant is that I have a wider variety of work. I work with clients in a bunch of different industries. I do better when I actually have multiple projects going on at the same time. So, I have um, a job task analysis for accountants right now, and I have a storytelling video for librarians. And those are really different kinds of projects. So for me, building the skills to be able to do multiple different things gives me that opportunity to do really different kinds of work. Um, so I think that if you are somebody who tends to get bored with things, figuring out, you may also have to look at your rhythms for your work. Blocking yourself in, say, 90-minute focus blocks of work and then with um, other things in between. So maybe you do a 90-minute focus block of development or writing work or whatever is the, the hard thing. And then you give yourself that 20-minute, okay, I'm going to go on LinkedIn and read some posts and make some comments or I'm going to go read some of the, some of these articles. And then you go back and you do the, another 90 minute chunk. That also can be a way because some of these things, again, if you've got that list, that Trello board of like things that I can do, maybe you might even prioritize that or, or flag them as like, these are 15 minute activities. So um, I think that that also, that might help as well. Definitely. Let's see. Pop to our next question here. We've got one from Heather. Give me a second here. We'll get that one up on stage here. Oh, my computer is not cooperating with me. All right. We'll go to this one. Uh, Teresa. Mm -hmm. Uh, just has okay, a general yeah. comment. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about Digo for, yeah, for a while. Yeah, so I think Wakelet's also on that Trello board. I know I blurred everything out, but I think Wakelet was also, I, I did some of the like alternatives to Digo and there was a nice list of other alternatives. So the, the field is actually a lot better now than it was, again, 
you know, 15 years ago when it was delicious for bookmarking. Those of us, again, who are, uh, who have been around long enough to have done delicious and, and deco. So, all right. Hey, it's a good thing we live in internet times because I can remember a time where the card catalog was a thing at the library. So <laughs> I, I remember doing the field trip to the library to learn how to look things up in yep. the bound books so that you could look things <laughs> up by keyword and cross reference them. That was the how to do research at the library and talk to the reference librarians was a field trip that we did in elementary school. Times have changed. I don't know what we did before Google. It was painful. It was definitely yeah. painful. Uh, we got one from Cecilia. When do more skills become a bad thing? So when is being a generalist um, kind of a problem? Yeah, I th I'm going to, I think I'm going to talk about this a little bit in this next, I, I think I'm going to answer this a little bit. Sure. Um, and then I see Laura's next question too of the, um, what sources do you use for determining the next growth areas? Um, I think that also is, I think both, those are two questions that I, I think I'm going to answer in the next section. We'll see. And if I don't, we'll come back to them. Okay, All right. Sure. Great. Let me, let me right, mark that one off. Let me just make sure we got everybody here. Yeah. Um, I All think right, good. That was, that was good to kind of pause to think through some oh, questions. All right. On, great. There might be another one here. Um, Rita wants to know what are the most important skills to grow for newer folks? Uh, I think also, I think now we're going to get into the what to learn. And so I think, I think in this next question, let, let's see if I answer those questions. Okay, perfect. In the next section. We'll here. start, we'll circle back. Stay tuned. All right. So yes, this is a field for generous generalists and more skills and more opportunities, but you do not have to be a unicorn who does everything. Despite, as we talked about um, earlier, the job search is broken and employers are looking for unicorns. And I know that that's the case. They want their purple squirrels who can do um, all the things. You cannot be an expert in every single thing. It is just not possible. Clients empl and employers will try and find that. It is not actually what I'm recommending. So let's talk about the model of this a little bit. Um, yeah. So if you are brand new to the field, you are probably sort of a caterpillar. You have a broad foundation across a bunch of skills. You are not necessarily great at any of them, but you can do a little bit of, of a, a bunch of things. Alternatively, sometimes people in the field are caterpillars, but vertical and they are, um, so like if you were somebody who is a multimedia development person, if you came from like graphic design and multimedia development, you might be very deep in the development side, but really nothing at all in any of the writing and other skills. So this is sort of where we start out is that broad general thing. In the accidental instructional designer, Cami Bean talks about T-shaped skills. So you have that broad foundation of a caterpillar, but you go deep in one area. And this is a sweet spot for a lot of people. You are much more useful on a team because you know a little bit about all the aspects of everybody else. You can work with all of these other people, but you are an expert with, with one thing. Now, again, job listings are gonna say, oh, we need a unicorn who has deep experience in everything of this. Nee, not going to happen. But you can get T-shaped. Over time, you can make more of those verticals longer. It is not the full unicorn who has everything on the bingo card, but you do have multiple skills across a range of areas. And so, yes, make, so, so you can, um, I love doing basic and turtle, doing logo programming to make the turtle move. Um, yep. Deep experience, master's degree preferred $60,000. Yep. Um, so, right. So we can make those verticals longer. All of those things that we did, frankly, all of learning the logic of the, 
you know, like learning our computer logic back when we were doing logo and uh, was it Baker Street writing was the word processor pre word, um, right? All of those things. Um, all does like help things get done. So this is where your goal is, right? You're going to, your goal is going to be, you can know, knowing that you can't get be a unicorn, but also to get yourself to sort of this misshapen comb where you've got more deeper experience. So these are build, big building blocks. Your exact mix is going to vary. So instructional design skills, I would say, is the, the needs analysis, the writing, the scripting, and also the learning science thing. Development and technology skills would be authoring tools, other media, visual design. I would also put UX in here, AI. And then there's also the business and communication skills, project management, working with SMEs, time estimates, aligning to business strategy. If you are a freelancer, that also includes those skills of running your business, pricing, finding and qualifying clients, writing proposals, marketing, business systems. Um, and so any of these things, right? And, and we don't get too hung up on like where something is in the categories, but do think of these as sort of three big buckets that you can kind of put them in. I'm not... I'm not real worried about which bucket things are in too much, but so instructional design and learning science. Early on in my freelancing, I was doing a screening call with a company that I wanted to subcontract with. The manager asked, well, who do you read in the industry? Who do you follow? You should be able to answer that question, I think you should have your sources, right? So there's plenty of instructional design books out there. You know, Julie Dirksen, the Clark Meyer e-learning and the science of instruction, Kathy Moore's map it, Patty Shank's books, Clark Quinn's books, um, Will Tallheimer's books. Um, you can do, again, we might talk about free webinars and, and events. LinkedIn, there's lots of professional discussion online. There's some crap too. Um, so, you know, filter your feed and, and unfollow people who are posting garbage. Um, but there are some valuable conversations that can still happen. Looking at those professional organizations like TLDC, Learning Guild, ATD, LDA, I think at least trying to look at the free resources for these, if money is a, is a real hindrance for you right now, and sometimes it is, but look at those things. So time for a little crowdsourcing. What are the sources that you trust and you learn from for instructional design and learning science? So save your development and technology ones because we'll do that next. The Journal of Implied Instructional Design, that's an open source uh, journal or open access journal, as I recall. And so you can read things. Um, and yes, yeah, some of these organizations have student pricing if you're in school. So absolutely looking at those. The Mastering ID community, that's uh, Connie Malamed's community. Um, she spoke yesterday, if you didn't get a chance to hear her on design thinking. Langevin Learning has courses. Udemy, ATD, Training Industry, Training Magazine. Yep. Um, yeah, if you're short on funds, check with your local library to see if they can get a book for you. Um, free access to scholarly journals. Um, local libraries often have access to LinkedIn Learning or the, the lynda.com. And so that can be something. I think Mike Taylor's weekly newsletter always has um, lots of great um, resources and links. Um, LinkedIn Learning. Right now, I know uh, Bridget and I both read the Neuron newsletter for AI. That's been one of mine. That's definitely in the technology things. But um, I think there's there's definitely um, journals, a ACT journals. Yeah, I think the finding people that you follow, trust and follow. Yeah. So thinking about development and technology. All right. 
do not just go for the next shiny thing. This is a really easy thing to do with technology. But in general, if it doesn't help solve a problem, it is not going to advance your career. And part of prioritizing your professional development time and investing in yourself does mean being cautious about getting caught up too much in the next shiny thing. Technology should not just be authoring tools. AI um, is clearly a thing that we're going to do, but do what you enjoy as long as you can, you know, solve problems. AI, visual design is a great development skill that many of us need to work on. I think the UX and UI um, can be great resources. Um, anything with multimedia skills, better video, better video development, or um, image development. How do you, you know, frame frame things? How do you do animation? Um, I let's see, where can I have that one? Um, I will put one other one resource. This is uh, ux uxl.com, um, which is. One of my All resources that I like too, about about accessibility, making sure that's on your list. Yes, or into your skills as well. Yeah, accessibility is a great one to add here. Um, UXL has paid things too, and I'm I'm about at the point where I might actually pay for it again. They have some more structured things. There's some free things, but there's also some of these. There's an arcade where you can play games, and so you can like spot the one where the alignment's right and find the errors in UX. Um, so that one's a good one if you're looking for a little bit of UX. So other, and I saw another on a interaction design, I think accessibility, yep. Um, so all of these things, um, I think some of the things that we mentioned earlier, right, the, the LinkedIn learning and the Udemy, um, YouTube, of course, has lots of things out there. Yeah, the web AIM, web accessibility in mind is a good resource. Um, it used to be Learning Ninjas. What did they change their company to? Build Capable? They have a bunch of resources for accessibility. Um, so all of that, so you can definitely look for, um, some of those there's, and there's definitely free resources. I, I am a big fan of use the free resources to get as far as you can before you start paying for stuff. Business and communication skills are also really important. That's the project management, working with SMEs, your time estimates, any sort of business strategy, general communication. If you are self-employed, there's all of the um, skills of running your business, pricing and, and all of those things. Those are also part of that communication and project management. Does anybody have other good sources for those business and communication skills? That's, I think, a tricky one to find as good resources for. I think it's one where we often um, I think it's I think the 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 other these skills um, it is it is trickier to uh, necessarily find things within L and D, and so we end up probably going outside of our field to find these things. Score for small business owners, that's for sure. Yeah, I think things like the Monday.com and Asana and, and Airtable, the project, the tools for project management, they often have their own things. So I think that that's a, a great option. Um, LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, yeah, I think there's probably pros and cons of each. And so looking for those sorts of skills. 
And I forgot to mention this session is recorded. So don't feel like you have to be furiously writing notes right now. You can go back, you can access it. And if you have a super awesome resource you want to share, make sure you dump it in the actual event feed because this chat will disappear at the end of the session. So if you want to throw in a resource for everybody to be able to see, uh, make sure you toss it in the feed, which is up at the top of your, uh, the menu bar at the top here. All right, uh, the recordings, it usually takes a couple days to get those up, but once they're up, you can access them through this platform, I think for a limited amount of time, but Luis will actually get them onto the website. So you'll have you'll have access for, for longer than that. Um, so not to worry, you'll be able to, you'll be able to watch the replay soon. Uh, you should also be able to watch the replay. Yeah, within the air meet, you'll be able to watch it right away. So you can go back and take some notes. Um, use one of those bookmarking tools of which several were, were recommended here. I do recommend um, having something like that to, to store some of those notes can also be helpful. Um, but yes, they'll be on the website later. I see some like Scrum Alliance. I'm trying to read some of these too so they're in the audio recording. Um, if you're an ATD member, the training ain't performance. Even if you're not an ATD member, you can still buy the book. And edX has free courses. Um, Yeah. So if you're an ATD member, the training and performance is free. So take that into mind when we were talking about uh, some of these paying for a membership gets you uh, some of these. Um, and when you join TLDC, there's also an awesome Slack group, which has some amazingly awesome things going on as well. So that's a great place to ask for resources, learn from people, find jobs have random chats, uh, find out about other cool opportunities like like this conference. And I think we had, Phyllis had a question about the slides um, about business tools, but I'm pretty sure you showed that already. Yeah, I was gonna say, I did go back to that. I will go back one more time. Just kind of thinking. Phyllis, this can we get a thumb been... up or did you get what you needed? And, and Laura and Rita, who I know you had questions about figuring out your next growth areas and what important skills to grow. I think that, that that's sort of what I was answering here. Um, if you don't feel like I have answered that sufficiently, um, put another, pop another question on the Q&A panel. I would say if you're fairly new to the field, start checking out job descriptions because you're going to see themes like we need you to know this tool and maybe you could start narrowing down what makes the most sense for you to start learning because my goodness, there's there's not enough time in the day to learn everything, but if you can find a theme in a in a job thread, pick the one that's the most important that you can apply in the most scenarios. And that's where I would go. Yeah. It And actually, if you wanna get yourself a little bit of AI experience as well, find some job descriptions, copy them and paste them into a Word document, put it into Claude, where you can upload a document or one of the other tools where you, or if you're you know, paying for one of the other tools and you can upload fi files. Um, if you put those into documents, I've found that Claude is pretty good at pulling out like what are the key themes, what are the skills that everybody's looking for um, and, and doing some of that analysis for you. Things that, these are one of the things that the AI is good at. Ooh. Michelle had a good one, negotiation. Learn how to negotiate. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't underestimate your value when it comes to pricing your your services, because I know as women, historically, we've been underpaid. We don't think we're worth what we are. So own it and embrace all your power and make sure you um, there's tons of resources, I think, from this workshop and previous workshops, um, plenty of people to reach out to and they'll be happy to share their their knowledge. Yeah. And, I, and again, I think in those business skills sides of things, like the negotiation, this is where we as L&D folks should be stealing from other fields, right? Like, go look at what other people are talking about. Um, Most definitely. Yeah, so there's still some other good... Oh, Cindy says, sometimes JavaScript is important to know. Um, for LMS. I know I've talked to other instructional designers. I know one, he's a coder as well and said, oh, it's so much easier when you know the coding languages to kind of understand how to piece everything together. So 
Um, if you're looking for a very simple coding um, website to learn from, Code Analogies is one of my favorite. They actually break it down with visualizations and exercises. I'll throw that one in the feed too. Uh, but I like my teacher brain likes that they break it all down for you to a way that you can understand these concepts in the way that it applies to real life. So, you know, like making a sandwich or something like that. So if you want to dive down into some, some learning, I'll throw that in the event feed for you and, and dive in. It's not quite as scary when you look at it that way than, than we look at coding and, and go, oh my gosh, that's too much. I can't do that. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can. So I would say if there is one thing for you to take away as an action from this session, go on your calendar right now and block some time and protect that time from meetings and other project work, please go do that now. I try to do mine earlier in the week so that even if it gets pushed, I at least have some other time, but I try to do it like first thing Monday morning is my like work on my business and my professional, so that that's some sort of professional development or working on my business or something that is not jumping directly into client work. That is literally paying myself first in time so I hope that you all have some strategies on how to make the most, uh, how to get a little bit more out of the limited time that we all have and some ideas on where to go with your investing in yourself and the skills to work on. This is fantastic. Can I get a thumb up or a reaction if you've already picked out something you, you want to learn? Now, what's going on your list? of things you're, oh gosh. Okay, so we've got a lot of yeah, people that, that, that are ready yeah. to go learn now. This is awesome. Yeah. Perfect. So definitely appreciate your time. I know it's we're right past the hour. I don't know what people have to do, but definitely feel free to stop by a table. I'm sure there would be people to hang out. I don't know if you have time to hang out for a little while, Christy, at a table, or if you've got to dive right back into something. But if you're not sure where to find those, uh, once the session closes, you'll be able to see the table tab. Uh, feel free to pull up a chair and join us if you can. Otherwise, there'll be some other tables today. Uh, but one more round of applause for Christy here as we wrap up, up the session here. And we hope to see you back. Uh, there'll be another session in an hour, uh, which I will be hosting as well. So hope to see you back shortly. And appreciate you joining us today. And we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you all for coming and for sharing all of your resources. And for all of you who are looking for jobs, I, I wish you the very best of luck. All right. Thanks so much, Christy. Bye, everyone.